Hey, and welcome to the fifth and final lecture from chapter four in your textbook. In this short lecture, we're going to discuss uh, Likert's four systems models, uh, or model. Uh, so these are, according to Likert, uh, they're... Uh, how can I put this? Well, I guess I can, I can put it like I wrote it, right? So, so uh, Rensis Likert argued that uh, all organizations can be grouped into one of four systems or, or leadership styles, uh, and that these styles reflect the degree of employee participation in decision making. So, so for, for Likert, uh, Likert was really interested in, in how much say employees have in, in, in running an organization. And, and he used this to create this four systems model where he said, okay, we could think about this level of, of employee participation uh, in four different ways. Uh, so these are the four ways, right? The exploitative, uh, exploitative authoritative method, the benevolent authoritative method, consultative and participative. So we'll talk about each of these, of course. So, so according to the exploitative authoritative method, right, uh, this is the, the method that we saw uh, being employed most widely uh, prior to, to the uh, advent of the HR school and the, and the human relations uh, school of thought. And, and so the idea of, of, of this model is that motivation, uh, employees are motivated by fear and, and through threats. Um, information flows from the top down, from the boss down to, to, to the rest of the employees. Um, employees are naturally suspect of, of, of management and their communication. Uh, decision making uh, is concentrated within upper management, so just the, just the managers and, and the owners and so on make decisions. Uh, orders are, are sent out and expected to be followed without question. Uh, and according to this model, we, we see high employee turnover, so you go through a lot of employees, people quit pretty quickly, uh, and generally productivity is kind of mediocre, right? Uh, meaning that it's, it's not that great. Now, the benevolent authoritative method is, is slightly different. <coughs> Here, uh, motivation, employees are motivated through both rewards and threats. Uh, communication is mostly downward, so mostly the managers telling other people what to do with a little bit of upward communication, so, so the employees have a little bit of say. Orders are issued, uh, but there is some opportunity to, to comment on those orders from the lower levels. Uh, there's moderately high turnover, so, so people don't stay that long. <clears throat> Excuse me. And productivity is fair. You, you, you're pretty, pretty productive. Now there's the, the consultative uh, method uh, where motivation occurs through rewards. So, you, so you, in this method, you're not trying to get uh, people to do what you want by threatening them. Instead, you're, you're offering them rewards. So if you sell 25 cars this month, we'll give you a $3,000 bonus kind of thing, right? Um, there, there is lower level participation in decisions. Not a ton, but there's, there's some. Uh, goals are set, so orders are usually made in the form of goals. Uh, after consulting with employees... Turnover is moderate, so people do have a tendency to stay at their jobs, and there's, there's solid productivity. And then finally, sort of the, the ultimate goal of, of the HR school is uh, participative, uh, excuse me, participative uh, model, right, the participative model, uh, where motivation is achieved through, through awards, right, through, uh, through achieving uh, goals and these goals are set up uh, through uh, or via communication with the entire group. Everybody's consulted, right? Management talks to the employees and and they have a, a significant say in, in setting the the goals and the rewards. Uh, there's there's lots of communication downwards still, right? The the bosses still tell people what to do, but there's also a lot of upward communication. So so the management gets a lot of feedback. And there's also a lot of communication amongst the lower order workers, right, and, and amongst peers. So, so everybody's talking to everybody, and everybody's getting everybody's ideas and getting a lot of feedback. And the idea behind this, of course, is that, uh, you know, especially on the lower levels, uh, people don't have a chance to realize their full intellectual potential. Uh, not only that, but, uh, I mean, the, the folks on the front lines are the, are the folks doing the work. So they probably know more about it than, than the employer. So why not get their uh, you know, opinions and, and, and feelings on how things uh, should operate? Uh, 
And so according to this model, decision-making is distributed throughout the organization. Turnover is very low, so people stay at their work because they, they tend to value it. And, and usually these kinds of organizations have excellent productivity, right? They, they, they do a really good job uh, at creating whatever kind of product they're offering or service. Now, uh, like any other model, there are critiques of, of the HRM model. Uh, and one of the critiques is that it treats all organizations the same, uh, regardless uh, of the work that they engage in. So, uh, you know, someone who's critiquing, or I'm sorry, critiquing the, the HRM model uh, might say, listen, you can't look at uh, Google, you know, as a, as a software and technology company, uh, the same way that you look at a company like GM that, that manufactures uh, a huge quantity of cars uh, using industrial practices, right? And so they would say, listen, these are fundamentally different businesses and need to be run in different ways. So what's good for one isn't good for them all. And, and HRM tends to treat all organizations the same. Um, also, there's an ideological critique of HRM that says that it's really just make, trying to make the employee something useful and uh, docile, you know, so, so they're not really uh, pissed off, right? It's trying to, it's trying to minimize conflict um, and, and just uh, ultimately wants to, wants to get the most out of employees. And that's true, right? Uh, you know, whether or not it's, it's beneficial uh, for employees to realize uh, their, their fullest potential in the context of, of achieving goals for the organization, right? It's still in, in the context of reaching the goals of the organization, right? It might not benefit the employee. That's debatable, right? Um, and so some examples of this, right? Uh, personality testing of employees, something that's become kind of uh, commonplace more recently, uh, really sets limits on employees. It creates insecurities, uh, gives the employer uh, too much knowledge about their employees, right? Um, now, employers would say, listen, we give people personality tests because we want to, to help them realize their potential and get the most out of them. Well, people who critique HR would say, oh, no, that's bullshit. You're just really trying to get more on your employees so you can figure out how to exploit them better. Um, and, and there's, I suggest to you, there's, each is uh, valid. Each argument is valid in its, in its own ways. So, I, I, you know, one of the things, I, I hate not being able to, to talk to you in class, but one of, the, one of the questions this raises, right, is, uh, you know, when do you feel motivated to work? What, what, helps, you, uh, what helps you feel motivated to work hard? And uh, that's a tough question, I think, because it's, it's different for everyone. And, and, of course, what HRM is trying to do is, is figure out some kind of universal uh, motivator. Right? And I don't know how realistic or how efficient that is, but it's nice to think that, that maybe we can. All right, well, that's it for this chapter. Thanks for checking out my lectures.